thought I'd start by reading Psalm 14. The theme is the foolishness of the world, the wisdom of God. And if you look at the heading, certainly in the Bible version I have here, it says, Folly of the Godless and God's Final Triumph. Psalm 14. To the chief musician, a psalm of David, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand who seek God. They've all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good, no, not one. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread, and do not call on the Lord? There they are in great fear, for God is with the generation of the righteous. You shame the counsel of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord brings back the captivity of his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. Well, we can know that there are so many people who are blinded by sin tonight, but we're coming to the great God to worship him. Now, I know that you'll all be very aware of the person I just want to introduce you to again this evening, and that's Isaac Watts. Isaac Watts, father of hymnody, they called him, I think. And I just want to say a little bit from his life story, some of which you might know, some of which uh, you might remember. But we'll throw your soul, because he, he was great, was Isaac Watts. When you consider... We're looking at some 350 years ago when he was born, 349 years. Next year will be the 350th anniversary. Uh, I should imagine there'll be some events taking place. Anyway, he he composed some 750 hymns. In doing so, virtually single-handed, he inaugurated congregational hymn singing as we know it today. He also wrote nine volumes on logic, astronomy and philosophy in which he explored the limits of reason and discussed God's creation as an extension of his power. He engaged with many of the scientific ideas of his time, including those of his contemporary Isaac Newton. Well, he was born in Southampton on 17th July... 1674. There's a statue in Southampton. My daughter and her family live in Southampton. You can see it in the park. It's great. He was the eldest of nine children. His father was a schoolmaster, also named Isaac. He was a nonconformist, a dissenter. He, that is, a Protestant who did not think the Church of England had departed far enough from the beliefs and practices of Roman Catholicism. When little Isaac was born, his mother, Sarah, who was descended from a Huguenot family that had fled from France, was under considerable strain because Isaac's father, the elder Isaac, was in jail because of his beliefs. The uh, reign of Charles II and various things were being tolerated and dissenters certainly weren't. Anyway, growing up, Young Isaac enjoyed reading and especially liked rhyming verse. On one occasion, during family devotions, he saw a mouse climbing up the bell pull and was heard to giggle. Questioned by his father, he replied that he had seen a mouse run up the rope and the thought had come into his mind There was a mouse for want of stairs, ran up a rope to say his prayers. At first, intrigued and then annoyed at Isaac's continued rhyming, 
his father ordered him to stop. Isaac didn't. Punishment loomed and Isaac burst out. Oh, father, do some mercy take and I will no more verses make. (laughs) Fortunately for the world, he did not follow through on this. One day when Isaac was six, Sarah, his mother, found some meaningful verses he had written down. And she wondered if her son had composed them himself at such a tender age. So she seated him at the kitchen table and asked him to write a poem. This he promptly did, using the letters of his own name in the form of a ten-line acrostic that showed the depth of his theological understanding at such an early age. This is a six-year-old. Listen to this. I am a vile, polluted lump of earth, so I've continued ever since my birth. Although Jehovah grace doth daily give me, as sure this monster Satan will deceive me, come therefore, Lord, from Satan's claws, relieve me. Wash me in thy blood, O Christ, and grace divine impart, Then search and try the corners of my heart, that I in all things may be fit to do service to thee and sing thy praise too. It's incredible. Anyway, also at age six, he saw a, a great big comet, a very bright one with a spectacularly long tail. It was known as the Great Comet of 1680. Kirch's Comet, or Newton's Comet, is called. And Isaac Watts frequently spoke about this, and probably it was that that started his interest in astronomy. He was obviously a precocious kid, a very talented kid, because from age four he was taught Latin by his father. Then at the Free Grammar School in Southampton he went on to learn Greek at age nine, French at age ten, Hebrew at age 13. If only we could do that. Perhaps some of you can. Anyway, he came to a saving knowledge of Christ at the age of 15. In 1688, he recorded in his diary, when he was age 14, he fell under considerable convictions of sin. And the following year, age 15, he fully trusted in Christ. He went to university, but he couldn't go to Oxford or Cambridge because they were allied to the Church of England. You had to be an Anglican to go there. So instead, he went at age 16 to Newington Green, London, to study at the Nonconformist Academy of Thomas Rowe, a leading academic amongst the dissenters. So four years later, he'd had a great education in theology, higher mathematics, natural phenomena, philosophy, went home. And then he spent a further two years studying and in prayer, being prepared for the great work he was to do. That's just background. At that time... Before the use of hymn books, the main form of musical involvement, of course, was via the singing or chanting, really, intonation of psalms. They were paraphrased and they were chanted. One Sunday after a service, Isaac suggested that the way that the psalms were sung lacks the dignity and beauty that he felt should characterise every part of Christian worship. His father challenged him to produce something better. He wrote his first hymn, Behold the Glories of the Lamb, which was well received by the chapel he was going to. And for the next two years, he wrote a new hymn for every Sunday. A bit like John Newton did that, didn't he? He wrote a hymn a week, I think. Or was it Cooper wrote it for him? Could have been Cooper wrote it. But Isaac Watts wrote a new hymn every Sunday. Well, I won't go into more detail. I'll leave it for another time if I'm back 
So there's a lot more information. But the sort of hymns he wrote. O God, our help in ages past. Jesus shall reign where'er the sun. Joy to the world. This is the day that the Lord hath made. Come ye that love the Lord. I've missed one out. This describes it as the best loved. It certainly is a very well loved hymn. I certainly love it. Hymn we're going to sing now. When I survey the wondrous cross. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll read the whole chapter. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him, in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptised in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptised none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I have baptised in my own name. Yes, I also baptised the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptised any other. For Christ did not send me to baptise, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness, But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, 
that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that, as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. I don't know if you're like me, but do you like quizzes? I like watching them on the television or seeing them in the newspaper. Like going sometimes when you have a quiz. We've been to some of the allotment society and it's great when you know the answers and you win, which isn't very often. But sometimes you'll watch something, I don't know, University Challenge. I do like University Challenge. You watch that and you just don't know most of the answers. The knowledge of the participants amazes me and I realise what I don't know although I do despair when there's a bible question they don't get it and it's easy but there we are tv and radio are full of knowledgeable people giving an expert view on this and that and people look up to them if you've got knowledge you're an expert suddenly and you're wheeled out and you're told um what you should think we see that more and more in our day and age don't we these so-called experts well they have wisdom yes in the eyes of many but in 1 corinthians 1 we see a contrast between worldly wisdom which they have and the wisdom of god And there is no comparison. We're going to look at the two this evening. I'm going to home in on verses 18, really, to 25 of 1 Corinthians 1. Paul is writing, remember, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So we should pay attention to the words here. Not only were they for the Corinthians, but they're for us now. We need to have a little think about what it was like in Corinth at that time. They had their celebrities in Corinth. They were no strangers to that world. The Greeks and the Romans looked up to and even worshipped those knowledgeable people, the orators, the poets, their leaders. And that had invaded the Christian church in Corinth. And you get a bit of a flavour of that in those earlier verses of the chapter where there were people saying, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Christ, and, and so on. They were almost into the celebrity culture there. Different men who had visited the church. And Paul already is starting to put right some of the things that were happening there as he highlights that in verses 12 through to 17. And he points them to Christ. That's all we can do, isn't it? Point people to Christ, not to mere humankind. He is the answer. Well, Paul, in this letter, primarily wants the church there to be united. He's concerned about the issues in the church there. So right at the outset, he starts to point them to where they should be thinking, away from themselves, looking unto God, looking to his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He introduces the letter by reminding them of what a privilege it is to be a Christian and what it is that Christ has done for them. So I'm going to look into headings, really, two big main headings, Worldly wisdom, then the wisdom of God. The culture in Corinth in the first century was thoroughly anti-Christian. It was marked by that cult of personality I just mentioned. Celebrity, the leading figures could attract a big crowd. And it wasn't just that. There was another cult, the cult of the body beautiful and the sporting image, the muscular person, all of that was out there. Doesn't it remind you of the 21st century? People were having their 
idols, literally, of other people. There was a great emphasis on entertainment and novelty. The theatre, the intellectuals were noted for their cleverness, what they were doing, more than anything else. Everyone wanted to be upwardly mobile. Corinth was a melting spot. Where it was was a strategic highway. It was a meeting place for north, south and east, west. All manner of people were drawn there. A bit like London, you might think, in the 21st century. You needed to be someone. You needed to be noticed. In our society, you've got people with their followers now on social media, haven't you? They want to be followed. People in the glossy magazines. People concerned with their appearance. People's views out there. Follow me. Agree with what I'm saying. Like me. Tick. And the Christian believers here in Corinth seem to have been in danger of being sucked back into that sort of mindset. Not with all those technological things, but this whole thing about it's all about this life. It's all about who you are. Who is listening to you. And Paul is saying, it shouldn't be like that. Look, and he says to them in verse 18 this. Remember, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. And the people who are perishing are not the Christians. The people who are perishing are those who have this worldly outlook on things. Perishing, perish. It's a strong word, isn't it? You often would not go to a supermarket and buy stuff that was out of date because it is perishing. We're all born with a use-by date. We may not know when it is, but that day will surely come when our life will end on this earth. People who reject the message of the cross are perishing. And on that day, that used by day, if you like, they'll have nothing when they stand before the judgment seat of Christ. They cannot bring anything to save them. Their wealth, their fame, their celebrity, it will count as nothing. They perish and those values perish. Fashions change, don't they? But if you're in peril, what should you do? Well, you recognise the danger. If you're in danger of perishing, you cry out for help. If you're in quicksand, say in Morecambe Bay, which you know is famous for its quicksand, isn't it? Help! You shout out, don't you? Seek assistance from someone who can get you out of that mess. They have special tractors, I think, to pull people out on that bay. But these people, these people with the wisdom of the world, these foolish people, these perishing people, didn't do that. They were so caught up in their own thoughts, desires and actions. They thought, they were wise. They thought the message of the cross is foolishness. I don't want any of that. I'm concerned about me and what I look like. Caught up in their own thoughts, desires and actions. Living for learning. Living for new experiences. Living to have a movement behind them. Today, people will listen to Sir David Attenborough, Greta Thunberg, Richard Dawkins. They hold them in high esteem. And they have some wisdom, but that wisdom is based on false premises. That wisdom is based on a lack of understanding of who is really driving this universe. And that's our great God. And we should be so grateful that we know him. God has made foolish the wisdom of this world. We see this in verse 20. What is wrong with the wisdom of this world then? 
Isn't it good to seek after knowledge? Didn't Solomon do that? Well, he did, didn't he? And he explored all sorts of different ways of entertaining himself, stimulating himself, getting knowledge. But after he'd done all of that, and you read about it in Ecclesiastes, you come to the conclusion with Solomon that they are meaningless in some Bible versions, vanities in others. He realised the most important thing to do, and you see it at the end of that book, is to seek God. He only knew true satisfaction when he factored God into the equation and acknowledged his own powerlessness before God. And all of us should, should do that. The problem with the people in Corinth and with so many people today is they factor God out of their lives. They don't want to think about somebody who is better than them, possibly. Someone to whom they need to bow the knee. They'd rather be self-sufficient. Oh, how foolish. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Psalm 14, we started with. They're perishing. Worldly wisdom looks in the wrong place. The peoples of the ancient world, many of them, did acknowledge spiritual powers, but they had their own little gods, didn't they? Made in their image. Greek idols, Roman idols, little gods. And in Athens, of course, they had that altar to an unknown god so that they could cover all the bases. They knew in their heart of hearts there was something just beyond this life. But they didn't get what it was and they weren't going to seek after it. They had their own ideas. They wanted these gods, these small gods, capital G, uh, small G rather, they wanted them to be in their own image. And Paul goes on in, in this passage before us to talk about what these people who knew there was a spiritual dimension were looking for. Verse 22. Jews request a sign. Well, of course, the sign that the Jews were looking for was the Messiah, the promised one, the one spoken of in the Old Testament scriptures who was to come. And they were looking for him coming. And what they hadn't seen is the fact that he had come. The one who had met the Apostle Paul when he was Saul on that Damascus road, the one who Paul was preaching, they still didn't get it. Jews were still looking in the main for this sign. Yes, there were some believing Jews, but not many. And then it Greeks, what do they do? Well, they seek after wisdom. Again, looking in the wrong place. They were looking for anything rather than God. The word Greeks there will stand for Gentiles. Anyone who is a, a non-Jew, of course. The Greek gods, well, yeah, they, they were okay, but they were sort of in a certain way. They couldn't really identify with humankind and certainly not with mankind's suffering. They, the philosophy of the Greeks taught that God was totally unable to feel and any notion of God being involved with humankind was, whoa, it's almost like that phrase, we're the plaything of the gods. That's where they were coming from. But we know that the true, the one and only almighty God did get involved. He sent his son into our world to live amongst us. What, in, what greater involvement could it be that he took our sins upon himself? What a great saviour. But they wouldn't get it. These foolish people, these people so caught up with their own wisdom, they didn't want the simplicity of the gospel message that Paul was preaching. People today have that problem, don't they? The gospel message is, is too simple for them, perhaps. 
Repent from your sins. Turn around. Look to the Lord Jesus and be saved. It's as simple as that. Repent and believe. And people just won't do it unless God quickens their hearts. If anyone uh, is looking at this recording, if it's out there, and you haven't trusted in the Lord Jesus, do so. Realise that you are perishing and you need to look to him and live. It doesn't require any payment from us. God himself paid the price in his son on Calvary's tree. So the Jews got it wrong. The Greeks have got it wrong. And the message of the cross, which is fundamental to Christianity, both groups didn't really understand and were so caught up in the things of the world. That was their foolishness. But God's foolishness, if you like, is our hope is the answer, is the anchor of our faith. God's foolishness, the cross, is greater than man's wisdom, as we will see as we look at the second point. We'll look at heavenly wisdom then, and power. The message of the cross is the power of God. Verse 18, and the wisdom of God Verse 24, power of God repeated and the wisdom of God. This wasn't just a a man hung on a cross. It wasn't a, a criminal like the others who were alongside him. This was the eternal son of God who had entered into our world. That cross was the one where he was hanging And Paul here is reminding his readers, the folk at Corinth in the church, reminding them that rather than perishing, they are being saved. They have been saved. They will be with the Lord Jesus in glory. Because he is the power of God and the wisdom of God. The power of God then, first of all. Think of what we read in John 1 verse 1. The word was God and the word was with God. Again, John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 3. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. He is the creator of the universe. And by him all things exist. You can see Jesus' power in the way when he walked the earth. His power over the elements, the miracles, the wonderful miracles. The wind and the waves obeyed him. The lame man jumped up when Jesus told him to get up and walk. The deaf, the dumb, the dead. They responded to his power. Lazarus, take Lazarus, dead in the tomb for four days, yet at the command, Lazarus, come forth, he comes out of that tomb, whole again. That incident alone surely would have proved that this Jesus was the Christ, was the Messiah, the one looked for. Surely that should have been enough. To persuade the Jewish leaders. But there's none so blind as them that won't see. They would have seen their power base exploding. Being taken away. And they weren't having that. So they sent him to the cross. After a mock trial. The cross, yeah. Powerless in human terms for a while. Then Jesus rose from the dead. Showing the victory over sin and death he's now ascended sits to the right hand of God what a saviour what power what a wonderful wonderful message what wisdom he has the power of God for he is God 
And this is the one the Corinthians had believed in. Surely you can't do better than be associated with the one who has the power over life and death. And yet they were slipping back. Paul's putting them right, and he'd put us right, if we are slipping back too. But it's the wisdom of God as well. Spurgeon, the great 19th century Baptist preacher, said this. He planned the way of salvation. He devised the system of atonement and substitution. He laid the foundations of the great plan of salvation. There was wisdom. Christ is the wisdom of God. It was by wisdom that Christ made the heavens and the earth, created man, even became a man. Jesus, at the age of 12, taught in the temple. He was speaking with the leading Jewish rabbis and scholars, wasn't he? They were amazed at his wisdom. He would have argued from the Old Testament concerning God's purposes, his plans, wouldn't he? And shown them what was coming to fruition. He would have spoken of himself, even as he debated with them, I'm sure. In the Old Testament, God himself clearly shows what he is going to do to rescue his people, to redeem his people. And he does it perfectly. Absolutely perfectly. At just the right time, Jesus was born of a virgin, clearly set out in Scripture, clearly predicted in the Old Testament, living among us, ministry for three years, teaching, preaching, healing, just living that wonderful life we see spoken of in the Gospels, showing people the way to God. People said no one ever spoke like this man. He was profound in his words. They were the wisest words that anyone would ever hear. People couldn't trip him up or catch him out. When the religious leaders tried to trick him, they never succeeded. When they asked him, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? He answered in such a way that they were astonished of what they had heard and they were made silent. Remember the way he approached the cross, surrendering to God's will. Remember Gethsemane, not my will but yours be done. And he went, the Lamb of God, he went to the cross and he completed that wonderful wonderful transaction for which the Corinthians should be so so grateful and so should we and so we should verse 25 summarizes our passage the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men Surely that's an encouragement to us when we're bombarded by all these opinions from everyone else out there. Look to the scriptures. Look to the Saviour. Look to God. Don't be impressed by worldly wise people. They'll get their rewards just as the Pharisees did. And they will have their ultimate judgment from God. The all-powerful God, the one they've ignored or blasphemed or spoken against. Instead, look to him, your saviour. Persevere. Don't look to them. Look to him. Don't give up. Remember, he is on the throne. Remember, he is coming again. Remember, it's only the power of the cross that can set people free. And as we think on these things, may they thrill our souls, but may they also encourage us to go out and tell others what the truth really is and point them away from worldly things. Encourage them to look to the Saviour. 
who is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Amen. Amen.